Good afternoon. Um, we're excited to uh, present our work on Digital Suzette. I'm going to give a brief overview of the project, its origins, and our goals. Then uh, Dr. J. <laughs> Diane Jakaki will be uh, describing some of the challenges and solutions that we found as we were tagging the text and discuss its integration into the LEAF uh, framework. And then Rebecca Heinzelman, who's my undergraduate research fellow, will describe work that she's been doing to create a schema, specific schema, to account for um, culinary uh, vocabulary and uh, elements in the text. And I want to note that we're speaking in English, but the site is French first. So this is our effort to sort of promote uh, linguistic inclusivity and uh, diversity in DH. So um, let me go to the next slide. Yeah, named for its main character, Suzette, uh, this textbook is a fascinating school reader for girls between the ages of 9 and 11 uh, in France. The author, Marie-Robert Alt, um, was a secular feminist uh, with utopian socialist leanings. Um, she published the reader at the dawn of mass primary education in France. In other words, education that was secular, mandatory, and free. Um, in the 1880s. Um, the Suzette project offers a lens into the cultural history of girls' education in France at a critical period, and to use the sort of the old phrase of Eugène Weber, the time when peasants were turned into Frenchmen. This textbook belongs to a specific genre of readers, which is what you, they're called romans scolaires. So these were textbooks that followed a particular set of characters throughout the whole textbook, the whole, throughout the whole reader, instead of a compendium or an anthology of short texts, which is the other main style. It would be used in reading lessons, as which you would see here with the girls uh, arrayed around the teacher. The, the girls would read the text out loud, which would show their comprehension, how well they read it, and the teachers would ask them uh, questions and maybe correct their pronunciation if they were from Bretagne or if they were from Alsace or something like that. Um, uh, it's important um, to note also that this reader covered not only, it was not just for teaching reading, it was for teaching the curriculum. And this is super important. For the first time, under the Ferry laws in the 1880s, students, ch children were not only learning uh, reading and writing and arithmetic and religious education. Religious education had been replaced by moral education, and now they were learning sciences, history, civics, and for girls, home economics, which can include things like horticulture, barnyard management, cooking, and sewing. So the, this reader covers, um, let me get to the next, oops, what happened there? I don't know. Let's see what you got. Don't look at that. Look at this. Don't look at that. Look at that. OK, there we go. Um, let's see. So this reader covers the curriculum through the story of Suzette, the, so the eponymous uh, character. Her intellectual and practical education starts out her mother has died, and so she's taking over sort of the, the homemaker role in the family. Over a million and a half copies of this book were distributed between 1888 and World War I. Each copy could be read by multiple cohorts of students, and it was probably the best-selling girls' reader in France of that period. My original goal, uh, sort of grew out of teaching, was to create a, a, a good digital copy of this text that could be annotated with uh, short essays by students. Um, and as we started to get into this project, cleaning up the text and tagging the text under the guidance of Dr. Jakaki, um, we pushed into new directions. The teachers of edition of Suzette is a complicated text. So you can see you have the, the narrative. You have narrative illustrations like you have with that door there. You have educational illustrations like the, the, the um, oil well and the crickets. You have um, que com questions for discussion that the students would uh, answer. There was a glossary in, uh, for the student text too. And the teacher's edition, which is the one that we're using, also has um, comprehension questions under uh, questionnaire and also model answers for all the um, discussion questions. So um, the teacher's edition also had, and this is sort of the key point, an index called the classification, which keyed each chapter 
to the national curriculum. Um, and that was something, you know, trying to deal with this complexity of the text structurally was something that we spent, spent a lot of time on. Um, what was wonderful is this classification allows us to start thinking about how the narrative embodies not only the curriculum, but also the cultural and ideological aspirations and tensions that were within the Third Republic's educational project. Tension between a progressive intellectual project, so teaching all these new things to boys and girls, but also a very conservative social model, like where were the girls going to end up? At home. Or maybe seamstresses. So there's a strong tradition of textbook studies in France. You have um, people like Pierre Noha, famously with his uh, article in Realms of Memory, uh, Les Lieux de Mémoire, on um, Le Tour de la France par deux enfants, which was the best-selling textbook, second best-selling book in France after the Bible, supposedly. Um, and also he has an article on Ernst Lavis, the historian's textbook, which was widely used. Um, more recently, digital humanities scholars have been using large data sets on textbooks to compare uh, and see like, what shared historical and geographical references they had. Our endeavor was a bit different. We were going to use a collaborative model using digital tools on a single textbook. So we're not looking at a large data set, but we're looking at something actually pretty small and defined, but something that could later be integrated with other similar projects. So before turning things over to Diane and um, Rebecca, I want to uh, briefly address why the classification became so central and a central organizing principle for our project. Suzette's classification is special. In, in all the other textbooks I've looked at from the period, and I've looked at a lot, none of them have a, a index that is so detailed. So Diane started calling this the decoder ring that we use to have an insight into the curriculum uh, of the re educational reformers, how they constructed it as a whole. Um, but also we can see, you know, so we can see like what uh, people, places, things, and topics that they uh, considered in important for individual subjects like hygiene or home economics or physics, but also we can begin to see how these are interconnected. For instance, in this chapter called La Récolte or Harvest, we have moral education, domestic, uh, horticulture, so that's part of the natural sciences, économie domestique, all of those things become linked. Illustrations of fieldwork, cabbages, chrysanthemums, and pumpkins are visual substitutes for object lessons, which was the real kind of pedagogical approach of the time. And they serve as substitutes for, that, for object lessons and triggers for written exercises. But the narrative links all these together through a story about peasant kind of the neighbors of Suzette and her family who are really resistant to growing Brussels sprouts. And so Suzette grows Brussels sprouts, and everyone's like, what is this stupid thing? It's this long with little bells hanging off it. And of course, they sell them very well at the market. Okay, so it's this criticizing, on the moral side, criticizing la routine, so peasant uh, inability to uh, adopt new modern techniques or modern crops, and um, then a discussion about how to cook uh, those crops and other kinds of cabbages. I constructed an agency table tracking the presence of curricular topics, and this is um, this just gives a sense of sort of the complexity of how the chapters are linked to some of these different things. If you simplify it, you get an idea of sort of four main topics uh, in the book that are closely linked. Natural sciences, home economics, moral education, and industry. A good example of this interconnection also comes from chapter 31, which is about rice. So Suzette reads... For dessert, she reads a story about um, rice in China. Um, and uh, this creates an opportunity for a lesson about the nobility of agricultural work, a lesson about China and sort of laudatory view of, of China and Chinese agriculture and industry, um, and uh, how you grow rice and how you cook it. So all these things get pulled together in a single sort of narrative moment. Um, these connections invite us to think about how the scientism that was sort of the ideology of the Third uh, Republic, uh, Republicans um, got, helped shape primary education uh, about everyday activities. So to pull urban and working class, rural working class girls out of superstition, 
out of habit and tradition, in other words, away from the church, you had to an and anchor them in the Enlightenment, in Enlightenment rationality, you had to transform their perception of everyday things. So this kind of basic things like cooking rice. So our website uh, invites us to explore these curricular topics and their interconnection through a dynamic table of contents that Dr. Jakaki contexts, yes, that Dr. Jakaki will present. It opens avenues for students and researchers to explore how its narrative explores these tensions between the progressive and the conservative. And we'll have things like um, this little scene where Suzette's younger brother, they're now kind of grown up a bit, he wants to get some money and go off and drink absinthe in the local bar. And she doesn't want to give him the money. And so he says, you know, well, the, the shadow of a man is worth, you know, 100 women. And she's like, no, um, that's not really the case. And so you have that sort of feminist viewpoint, but then you have also this kind of comparison early on in the novel, or in the book, um, between the heroism of Jeanne d'Arc and the heroism of Suzette taking over for her dead mother. And you see a lot of sort of visual similarities between these two uh, images. A further aspect of the project that invites exploration and um, collaboration is the use of linked open data. So we made a gazetteer and we were able to track the presence of different uh, settlements, regions, um, and countries noted in the text and uh, produced something like a heat map that allows us to see sort of the presence of the French colonial empire in the text and how that, and we can go back and think about how that is, um, how that is treated. Let's see. So um, with that, I'm going to turn things over to Dr. Jakaki and she will talk about uh, yeah, Dr. J, and she'll talk about the... All right. Stay up here. Come back. Nope. Don't go away. <laughs> Stay. You can cheer on Susan. Uh, Suzette. You think I'm Suzette? <laughs> She's on the progressive side of things. <laughs> All right. Um, so I have a very interesting job. Uh, but uh, one of the things that makes it interesting is that I get to work with amazing students, um, several of whom are here today, and Rebecca is exemplary of the, the excellence of, of the, the student uh, uh, contributions to these projects. Um, the other is that I get to work with wonderful colleagues who are ready to collaborate and always push me to, to do more um, and think about how digital humanities can serve them as opposed to how they can serve digital humanities. Um, but uh, oftentimes I feel like, uh, if you ever heard the term about uh, Freda Sarah and Ginger Rogers, where she was just as good a dancer as he, but she had to do it backwards and in heels. Um, oftentimes I'm working on projects with, with colleagues who uh, work in languages different than my own and on subject topics that are different than my own. So it's this double kind of, wait, what are you talking about? Um, so, but it takes a while to get through those conversations, and especially on a uh, complex and interesting and unusual project as this, it takes time. And um, we figured out yesterday that it's been about five years since we've started talking about this project. And I recall sitting in John's office, and he showed me this strange book uh, that had the first image he showed me was of blue cheese and the second like this is illustration of blue cheese and the second was of like microbes under a microscope yeah. mm -hmm. and that was very interesting and confusing um, but mostly interesting so what started is this idea as John said is a simple uh, website that students in his classes uh, could annotate and contribute short essays to became very quickly, much, much more, and it continues to expand as we further interrogate the text and what we can reveal and analyze about it. Um, to, uh, to summarize, we had six goals. Uh, to capture differences between the teacher and student editions, to describe the printed text in TEI XML, to add different types of glosses, and so integrate printed text and editorial material that were separated in the printed uh, version, to understand the underlying French imperial under, under curriculum through capturing prosopographical information, and to prepare the text as we worked with it for analytical approaches through data mining. 
Uh, as you can see, we had many challenges uh, to face, not least of which was that we were, at first had only very bad scans uh, to work with. Um, I didn't put up a picture because it's, it's alarming. Um, the first generation of students were actually hand transcribing in Google Docs. Uh, but we also had to think about how we were going to work our way through encoding this text because as we and students encoded our way through the text, we kept discovering new things and new ways to tag them. So we had to capture kind of basic or base versions of the text so that we could at every point step back, reflect, and then go on to the next thing. But there, was also fan there were also fantastic opportunities. Uh, working on this project helped me to think about new ways to consider phased encoding uh, that allowed us to move forward strategically rather than blathering all over the screen. Um, uh, it allowed us the chance to experiment with new tools and environments like Transcribus and then LEAF, thanks to um, Susan Brown and the Quirk uh, Collaboratory. Um, which has been one of the most rewarding experiences for me at Bucknell, working with John and Rebecca and all the students who've come before, even through pandemics and tribulations. And it gave us the chance to collaborate with several uh, uh, generations of students, most of whom were new to DH, but um, who have since become like total nerds in a good way, um, and who have all profoundly shaped, in, in, in the best possible loving way, and have all profoundly shaped the Suzette Project's uh, vision and evolution. Even after we pulled uh, the text out of Transcribus and into TEI, we faced challenges related to seeing what we were encoding. The more we tagged, the more we felt that we were losing sight of the text. We couldn't see the text anymore. Uh, so fortuitously, we were at that moment uh, launching LeafWriter, uh, which helped the students to start tagging the text more thoroughly and for us to check their tagging more thoroughly, more carefully. And through Leaf's entity lookups, we were able to start capturing and connecting authority information about the places and historical people in the text, which is leading us toward the kind of linked data that John alluded to. So now we're moving on to the analysis and publication uh, phase of the, of the project with LEAF as our platform. This paper is not about LEAF. Uh, I have pamphlets. Feel free to take one. I'll give it to you afterwards. Uh, but I want to uh, focus now on the, the uh, examples of the kinds of things that we can do uh, for a project like uh, Suzette. Um, to date, we've pulled in all 144 encoded chapters that include the text, access to entity information, as well as facsimile views of each page of the text. We're experimenting with new ways to present prospographical data, and now I'm going to show you a couple of uh, live examples, so please pray. Um, we were just making these last night. Uh, there's always a stew. No, don't do that. Don't do that. Come back. Um, go, wait, oh, please. Like I said, never do a live demo in real time. Okay, good. Back, go. All right. It says load. It'll load. Pay attention. Um, so uh, we were able to, as I said, um, uh, create full text uh, um, encoded uh, uh, chapters with facsimile images. I'm going to move to the next one if I can. I'm going to stay out of um, full, full screen for this if I can. Um, we were able to create um, the, the prototypes for personographies. Um, there are many, many historical persons in, um, in the text. So what we are trying to do is capture not only um, their nationalities, also their professions, which are going to connect with Link's uh, vocabularies for occupation, and to point to each chapter they're referred to in, and also in what context, as John was talking about. Um, yep. So it's interesting to see where a historical character will appear if he's in the history section. Uh, and if you remember the, the kind of the, the network map I had, history was fairly small. That should make you happy. Um, but they might appear in Moral, or they might appear in Industrie, or both. Um, and so that becomes an interesting question. Why are they, like, why are inventors so important um, in yeah. this textbook? So it says, as I said, this is very much a, a project that is in. Um, uh, uh, active development, and we have many more things on the uh, the very close horizon. Um, 
we had a hard stop with last night, so we decided not to try and do any more than we already did. Um, and as John referred to, we had this, um, as many uh, good digital humanists uh, will, con will uh, confirm, we spent a lot of time in spreadsheets. This is what the uh, decoder ring looked like, but this is what we're going to um, reveal from it, which is what is called um, the dynamic table of contexts. And it's very small on the screen, so I can't quite bring it up. Um, okay, so the dynamic table of context actually stitches together all of the, the chapters. Um, you're able to negotiate each chapter um, uh, through by, by negotiating the table of contents. So you can see that you have any number of, of chapters that you can refer to and negotiate through the text. You can also look and see where um, from the classification you've got um, different, come on, there you go, where different parts of the classification show up or classification show up. Um, uh, shoot. Um, and I'm gonna just, uh, uh, and you can actually negotiate where in the text you can find the particular people and places we're talking about. So I'm gonna hand it back to Rebecca who's doing the really cool next step. Sorry for taking so long. All right, so we're getting kind of down to the wire here, so I'm just gonna go ahead to the good stuff. Um, so as Dr. Jakaki and Dr. Westbrook mentioned, um, a key component of this text is the culinary concepts that it addresses. So what I ended up doing is I used the classifications and our table of contexts to create a concept map to kind of start thinking about the ways that culinary concepts are addressed in the text. Um, but I realized that this really only addressed events and activities and I really wanted to get into objects and things of that nature. Um, so I ended up using spreadsheets, of course, uh, to get into the TEI elements that I would be using, which were object name, event name, and trait. Um, so I took all of the relevant nouns and wrapped them in the object name tag, and they were all given up to three attributes, which were type, subtype, and key. Type corresponds to broad descriptors. Subtype uh, narrows in on more specific things, such as if a utensil is an appliance, a handheld item, or a piece of furniture. Um, then the key, obviously tags the specific item. So one of the big things that we ended up looking at is the difference between foodstuffs and ingredients. So the text um, deals with both abstract concepts, just talking about, for example, parsley in general, and also parsley as part of a recipe. So we needed to come up with a way to distinguish those two things. Um, then we kind of got back into my concept map and are using the upcoming TEI element event name to talk about the four steps of cooking, which we narrowed down to acquisition, preparation, presentation, and consumption. Um, so that's what we have here in the example of drying pea pods in the oven. Um, and then our final step was talking about evaluative language because a key part of cooking and learning how to cook um, is being able to evaluate and talk about your own cooking and the cooking of others. So we used the um, trait tag to talk about um, evaluative language as well as sensory experiences, um, if they were positive and negative, things of that nature. So in this example, Suzette's neighbor is discussing Suzette's soup and says that she's made a real bourgeois bullion, a really good one, um, which was really important to us because um, we wanted to show that Suzette is talking about the ability to create good dishes even if you're not part of the bourgeois, which Suzette is not. The next step of our project is going to use the gazetteer and the maps that we were talking about earlier um, to capture the culinary implications of those places. So we're going to add in um, a type and subtype to our place name tags in order to show whether um, a certain object is either cultivated or produced in a certain region or if there's a recipe that is uh, regionally specific. So using the earlier example of rice in China, that would look something like this. Um, and as we continue towards the future of the Suzette project, we're going to need to evolve and change our schema, um, but we're really excited about it because this is the first digital edition of the Suzette book, um, and we are really excited to use our schema and what we've learned and apply it to a broader corpus 
of Third Republic textbooks and culinary uh, texts. Thank you.